get started here. We've got about an hour that Matt, Sonny, and I are reserving to answer your questions. So I'm sure people will kind of pop in and out and ask their questions. Um, Matt, I think you were going to do some housekeeping stuff and let everybody know sort of what our plan is. In terms of yeah, so um, I'll just mention it, but we won't we won't dive straight into it right now. We'll just give people a couple of moments to, to, to get involved. But um, what we are, uh, what we're going to do is um, we're obviously here to answer questions. And, uh, and to give some thoughts and give some ideas and inspiration on, um, on how to hopefully navigate some of the difficult times that we're in. Um, the way that we're gonna play, the, uh, play, play this is that we're gonna request that, that pretty much everybody stays on mute initially, if that's okay. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll ask you to, uh, to put your questions into the Q&A. Um, and so if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see that there's a little lovely Q&A little button so just hit that um, pop your questions in there um, and then what what we will do is um, we will take those as many as we can and give our thoughts on them and so we'll each take one and then open it up to to the other people on the panel if that makes sense so that we can uh, we can then deal with as with them as comprehensively as we can um, if we can't answer them we'll be honest and we'll say we have no idea and uh, and that's and that's the way of it but hopefully um, Knowing me, Sonny, and Ashley like I do, uh, we probably will have some thoughts, you know? We've got plenty of answers. We've got a lot of thoughts, a lot of mm -hmm. ideas. So yeah, so there's more and more people joining us now. So welcome to everybody that's joined. Yeah, so um, really, uh, I, for those that don't know us, um, we all work with leadership teams um, across the world. We're all brand specialists. Um, and um, when we talk about brand, as, as no doubt, um, you've heard me say before, but we're not talking about a logo and some fonts. We very much view brand as um, as the complete package, and we very much view brand as being something that is a leadership responsibility. Um, and I define it anyway, and I know Sonny and Ashley have a similar definition as the meaning that people attach to you. And so, as um, as you take that definition, what it means is is really you don't kind of own it, your audience owns it. Like, so you really have to become empathetic. So brand empathy is a huge thing. And obviously in these times, I think we're seeing that more and more where we need to get empathetic with our customer base, know who we serve and understand how best we can serve them. So that's a little bit from me. Do you want to, Sonny and Ashley, do you want to, uh, to say anything to intro this session? Yeah, so I would, I would, uh... I mean, most of you know Ashley and I. Ashley's the redhead, and Sonny's the one always in the fedora, <laughs> the ever-changing fedora. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so we've been in the brand industry for about 15 years. Uh, we started Motto when we were in our early 20s with uh, $250 in our bank account, and much to the dismay of many, many people who said that we would fail. And now, 15 years later, here we are, pioneering a very cool agency with offices in New York and uh, Dallas. And now we are co-authors of a new book, uh, Rare Breed, A Guide to Success for the Defiant, Dangerous, and Different. And, uh, you know, very much to what Matt said, uh, we, are, we are believers in the power of brand, the power in being able to outline not only what your audience wants, but also what you want your brand to be. So I really believe that a lot of times many companies don't actually take part in, in actually intending what they want their brands to be. And so we often as leaders, or at least in our experience, sometimes leaders are a little bit more hands off than we'd like them to be, that the, the brand belongs to the audience. When in fact, I think it's an actual two way street where you actually have to build the brand that you want and hope and look to your audience to also receive that sermon because you want to get the people to the right church and you want to get them to your church and it's important that you understand the sermon that you're delivering and what that brand's going to be but i think especially in, in today's times with the landscape as it is that we have to think about how that message is going to be received so tone is where 
I think we have to all finesse our brands in, in, in this particular era right now of what's going on. So that's a little bit about us. I didn't know you were going to like say stuff about yourself. Like I should probably say a little few things because they're probably thinking, wow, that, that guy, Matt, what on earth is he doing there? So <laughs> I, I just turned up. No, I didn't. Um, I, I'm here because um, I'm a brand consultant here in the UK. So I'm based in Nottingham near where Robin Hood is. Um, I, uh, I run agents. Uh, I've in the past run creative agencies. Um, but for about a year and a half now, I've just been um, on my own as a solo, solopreneur, as they like to say. Um, and basically what I do is I work with leadership teams to really help them align around their core brand uh, position and, uh, and help them then to cascade that out internally within their organizations and then out to customers. So I'm quite a generalist, um, but at the same time, you know, very big strategy head, if you know what I mean, um, with a core of, of brand strategy being basically part of my offer. So that's me. And I'm, I've also written a book called Story Strategy. Um, which is all about using story-based techniques to help frame and shape that brand strategy. Um, I find storytelling one of the, the major ways to create meaning. So um, I basically build that into my thinking um, and it's incredibly powerful. So, so that's me on this side. Not quite as, as, as exciting as rare breed. Story strategy, you know, is, is, along, is, along, is along those lines. But um, Don't let him fool yeah. you. Matt is amazing. So, and the three of us have really, you know, recently gotten together. Uh, yeah. which I think is really cool. He's a brother, another mother. Yeah. <laughs> we I'm consider British, Matt our so like kind of brother from it. across the pond. <laughs> um, but the reason that we've been getting together recently for these uh, webinars and for this live Q&A session with you guys is because we have such a like-minded point of view on brand. And we know you guys are all sort of either within companies that are really trying to figure out this world that we're living in right now and wondering what to do or you're somehow out on your own, um, maybe you're a freelancer, or you're some kind of maybe in the professional uh, creative industry, or you're a professor like Antonio, um, who, who does branding and, and is a strategist himself. So, you know, this, this is a conversation for all industries, for all people, no matter where you are, what you're struggling with, what you're doing. Um, I would love to just go ahead and get started answering some of these questions. And that's really what we're here to do today. I think, Matt, you're going to check yeah, in. Yeah, um, I've just been looking at the chat. Some people are saying that, 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 that there does not seem to be a place to write in the Q&A. So um, I just want to make mention that, but some people have started to put the questions in the chat. Um, what we're going to try and do, if we can do the tech, is uh, basically um, once you've asked a question, if we like the look of it, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to um, we're going to kind of invite people. We're going to ask you to write your question in, and then we're going to invite you on, if that makes sense, so you can we can speak to you and we can get some of that that kind of um, conversation going because we might to answer the question we might have to dig a bit deeper and we might need to explore a couple of things so i can see some people are writing some questions on uh, on the chat um we it's a bit strange because last time we, we we completely had um you know no problem with people putting questions in the in the q a um I it just says why that me, might be happening but i think in the interim go ahead and po pop it into the chat there yeah let's do that data. That allows us to, yeah, so all panelists and attendees. So yeah, that should, you should be able to. Okay, so, so okay, if you cool. put, start popping your questions in. We've yeah. had one from Daniel, um, I'm going to say your name wrong. I'm really bad at this. Uh, anyone will tell you from last time. Uh, ban, ban, Banza. Banza, <laughs> hopefully I've said that correct. Banza. Um, Banza. Um, let's, uh, let me just try if I can find you. Um, I don't believe, you're on mute. Um, I don't believe. I, right. Here he is. Here he is. Yeah. Hello. Daniel, Hi. um, your question, you've 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 written it down and you've got about five or six elements to it. Before we go into that, do you want to just possibly just kind of give us a very brief intro to you and um and you know maybe condense your question down and we can dig into some of the details a little bit um with you in a minute. Go for it. Sure, cool. Uh, I'm Daniel. Uh I work I'm I was born in Germany. I live now in Mexico since 15 years, and I work with uh, the Uncommon Lubricant Company. We develop, um, our company makes tailor-made industrial lubricants, so very unsexy if I compare it to what you guys do. Uh, but the thing is that, um, so we serve customers in the steel, mining, and uh, glass making and packaging industry, and the food industry, food makers. 
uh, around the world, a uh, very niche player. And now uh, we had this, um, should I go into the challenge now or should I talk? Yeah, yeah, more? no, um, yeah, go for it. Go for it. Okay. So um, we have been, we have, have this problem right now. So we have a, a, a scientist team that develops like over 80 tailor-made new products every year for customers around the world. And it's all, normally it's based on lubricants for the industry. But now, uh, as we face the trouble of uh, shutdowns and uh, being having the risk to not be able to continue producing and delivering to our customers around the world, and then having uh, food production processes stop or, or um, pharmaceutical product chains stop because uh, the, the, the parts break down, yeah. we said, okay, we have to do something to keep our, our, our people safe and um, keep uh, operating as well as possible. So our scientists, we are, uh, they have developed a line of products that I've mentioned there. Like we've seen that, okay, we need to keep our plant, like new virus to come into the plant. We need to block this. So people who come into the plant, uh, how can we disinfect them like through a tunnel or something so that the virus gets killed off? Uh, how can we, um, when people touch things so that their hands don't get, if the virus is somewhere on the surface, that it doesn't stick on their hands. How can we keep uh, the hands protected like a coating or a shield? Um, how can we do this? Uh, how can we keep surfaces like tools that people use uh, and they, they share? How can we keep them from, if the virus get in contact with these tools, how can we uh, block them? So our scientists have developed skin products, surface protection products and other kinds of things that have nothing to do with our core business. Yeah. Uh, but we have developed these products and they are right now in testing for their effectiveness and durability. Uh, and now uh, we have been using it now for a week. And now we think that we should donate these kind of things to, uh, to hospitals or to other uh, healthcare workers and other kind of existential industries that have to keep working uh, and cannot risk um, uh, yeah, being infected by this virus. No? So, but now uh, we have the dilemma of, okay, so if we donate it and then maybe if we have the formulas and we can manufacture these products on scale, we could sell them, but uh, what kind of branding should we engage or what kind of branding, do we have to adjust our brand in general, like to reposition ourselves, not only as a lubricant maker, but in general as the, as a, whatever this category is, or should we uh, tell just the story that how we develop products for us, and we will share them with the world and with our 2,500 customers who wants yeah. it. And so yeah. my yeah, question yeah. is, what, what do you recommend? Okay, um, I'm just gonna do a quick little, just gut instinct here on what I think that you should do. And then Matt and Sonny, you can join in and, and probably contribute some ideas as well. Um, I don't think that you should start a whole new brand. I think that a lot of companies, what we're seeing, if they have the machinery, the equipment, the the, the skill, the talent internally to pivot the product into a different category. I think the most effective use of the branding platform that you have is to communicate the shift in why you're doing this. It gives you relevancy right now as a business as well. We see a lot of distilleries, for example, instead of making beer and gin and vodka, they're making hand sanitizers, or we're seeing Nike and Gap turning their factories into making masks and hospital gowns. So I, they're not creating new brands, they're creating new products for right here and right now. And I think that would be the most effective shift for you guys, instead of starting something new, um, help your audience understand why you're doing this. Um, for the greater good, I know there's probably a couple people on this on this talk right now who are facing similar things within their business as well. And I think that um, the most effective use of your time, resources, and and energy instead of creating a new brand, which takes a lot of time to do and do well and do successfully and to invest in, um, I think that you should just pivot the communications and help your audience understand again why you're doing this, the significance of it, the tech behind it the research that's driving it, and how ultimately, you know, the, the big why, if you will, on uh, giving this, this particular challenge and initiative some meaning. Okay. Matt, Sonny, anything else? Yeah, yeah, I've got a couple of thoughts. I mean, firstly, I wanted to say, Daniel, how fantastic it is to hear that story, like how fast you guys must have pivoted into producing some of this stuff and how you have basically done what, I, um, what I'm advising a lot of my clients to do, which is to, to think about their tribe, if that makes sense. Like who 
are we serving? Who do we serve? And then looking at their needs and then looking at basically trying to alleviate their pain. And so you've literally done that within three weeks. Like some of my clients are still on that journey. They're just kind of getting over the stress of, of having to get people in, you know, remote working. So it sounds like you've done that super fast. Um, like Ashley, I think at this moment in time, what should the priority be? Should it be um, spending time trying to create, you know, a completely new brand identity, look and feel, tone of voice, which is what you'd want to do properly? No, I agree with Ashley. I think the, the key is to get it out there, right? Um, however, I would say, um, and this is probably just with a caveat, that um, if you decided in the future to, to do this longer term, um, and you thought that there was a market here and a need here, and um, then at that point, say in a, in a, few, a few months' time, I would probably suggest you then think about um, spir you know, spinning it off as a new, as a new offering. And that, that's because from my perspective, I don't know what Ashley, if Ashley would agree with this, but from my perspective, the key thing of a, of a proper brand strategy is to make decision-making easy for the customer. So this is quite a different offer to the lubrication business that you've got. And so for me, a uh, longer term, if you decide to do this longer term, then uh, you might want to kind of re, you know, create a new brand identity and, and it becomes part of the story. This brand was born out of the needs and necessities of the, uh, of the problems of the coronavirus. And then it kind of keeps it clear. But for now, as Ashley says, keep it, keep it with what you've got, make it part of your core brands, you know, your core, core brand communications. Um, and it keeps you super relevant um, as, uh, as we see the, the, the turmoil, uh, um, you know, hopefully start to die down. Uh, Sunny, do you have any kind of final thoughts or um, are you happy with that? I, I think you guys did a beautiful job. I don't have anything to add to that. I, I definitely want to uh, scoot over to Annie because Annie has a couple of good questions in here as well. Okay, Annie, let's do that. All right. Annie, thank you, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, thank thanks, you. Daniel. I hope that was helpful. Yeah, uh, kind of because I need to put a name on the product. <laughs> oh, I see. So I don't know. <laughs> so now our our product naming is super engineer like and super boring. So I want to create like uh, this concept. If somebody later wants to chat with uh, with me, maybe to share some ideas or to uh, bounce some ideas back and forth, uh, mm -hmm. I would be very thankful. Yeah, I'd definitely I definitely say I name. Would, I would. Um, I would. I would uh, try to explore the idea of uncommon, mm -hmm. which is the, what, what is inherently within the name of your organization anyway. See if there's any sort of directional paths within that idea that you could probably start to, what, well, that's what we call legs when it comes to naming. Does this brand have legs? Um, so if you're introducing a new product, I think that there could be something in there um, within the uncommon realm that might be really interesting to explore. Okay, thank you. Okay, Annie. Hi, guys. Um, so I have had the pleasure of being a client of Sunny and Ashley's in the past. So I'm really excited to, to see you guys again. Um, and my question is that aside from, you know, sounding empathetic, is there anything that a brand can do if there's not actually any change to their business strategy nor any kind of big PR push um, like donating money or creating a fund or partnerships. Um, so, you know, Sunny and Ashley, a bit of an inside joke, but Felicity has been working overtime in her comms. And uh, I think that the kind of communications that my company has done have been really successful. Um, the CMO of First Dibs actually forwarded around one of our communications around um, us being a digital platform to her marketing team and was like, this is the kind of messaging we're supposed to be doing right now. Um, so I know that what we're doing is working, but there just isn't any kind of business strategy that's different that we can express right now. Yeah, Annie, um, I, I think that you guys should go all in on educational content. Mm -hmm. I think that you guys have an amazing opportunity. Do you mind if I share the, the, the name of the company? No, not at all. So Annie works for Artnet, um, which is an organization who is designed, it's a digital platform that allows um, art to be valued. And, uh, and you can go on Artnet and look through their database to understand what a piece of art 
um, is valued at. And there's just a ton of really great stuff that this organization does. Um, they're really the leader in this realm. And I think that going all in art right now, in my opinion, like is, is like a breath of fresh air. I think right now the world is in such a dire circumstance that art is actually something that can be positive and uplifting and can shift the conversation into creativity and into the ideas of why we need art in our lives and, and, and things like that. So I think that there's a lot of really interesting educational uh, material that you guys could create and also this idea around collecting and investing in art. So right now we're seeing a lot of things like, oh, should I invest in the stock market? Should I invest in, right, you know, something like that. So I think there's maybe some investment opportunities here that, you know, when it, as it relates to um, uh, educational content that you guys could creating that, that maybe could help people see why investing in art would is, is a long-term strategy and why that could be su super valuable to them. So I think that definitely educational content is, is probably something that you guys should lean really heavily into and, and really looking at Artnet as helping the audience, because I know you have a lot of different kinds of audiences as well, helping really segment those out and helping each one of them um, kind of see how Artnet belongs in their life right now. Thank you. Anything? For you guys, Sunny? Uh, Matt, what do you got? Anything? Well, um, I don't know a huge amount about that space. I think um, in, terms of, in terms of your question, um, was it, if, I've, if I can summarize it from what I think you were saying, apart from sounding empathetic, is there anything else that you can do? Is that, is that what you were saying? Because you're not changing the business model, you're sticking at what your offer is, um, mm -hmm. and that's it. I, th I think you do need to do something. I think you need to respond somehow to the current uh, situation because um, to not have anything to say seems a bit seems a bit like irrelevant if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I what my message is, uh, my suggestion is is think about the tribe again, right? I'm going to go back to this loads today, so forgive me. Think about the tribe and think about what the message needs to be. And I actually touched on. Uh, education from a from an art perspective I think that's a really smart move um, but but what you've got to look at is is what is their need right now and how can you add some value to them so it might be putting spotlights on stories of um, of of your customer base who are doing a great job or have you have have I don't know maybe position their art in an interesting way or maybe got out some old pieces that I don't know. I don't know your space that well. I, I, uh, I'm not very good at collecting art, but it's the um, it's one of those things. Dig deep. Think about that. And one thing I would say is if we're not sure, if you're not sure, why not um, <laughs> actually take some of your what I would call your brand champions, like people that love you, love doing work with you, really trust you. Um, and just give them a call. Like you don't have to do it. Loads of them. Just pick pick five. And, and call them and say, hey, uh, how's it going? You know, what, what, what could we, could we do anything for you? Like, how could we help you? What's your, you know, what's your current frustrations? If, and maybe have some ideas as well. Like say, if we did this, would, would you see any value in that? Like if we, if we created some videos of us, um, you know, doing a tutorial on how best to position art in a room or something, would that be of, of interest to you? Would, that, would you find that helpful? That kind of stuff. And they might say, no, that's a load of rubbish. But then you've opened the conversation up and then you could say, okay, well, what, what could be what could be of help so there's a couple of thoughts in terms of getting customer centric and tribe tribe centric thanks i i actually have a question annie what what do you what do you think you're doing well i think we've done our response incredibly well um mm -hmm. and you know we we came out early with you know a letter from the ceo that was really empathetic and and also underscored the idea that we've been championing the digital space for 30 years like this is our home and now the art world has nowhere to turn, but here. Mm. Um, I think that we've reframed our product verticals in a way that feels relevant and sensitive while still trying to earn revenue, you know? Um, and, and we're lucky in that our platform just lends well to the current moment. But I think that there's a lot of people doing splashy things in art right now. Mm -hmm. um, so it feels like without the splashy element, and we are doing a lot of educational content, and we'll continue doing that. So, so thank you, Ashley. Um, it feels just like something may be missing. Like, like our audience is, particularly after the letter came out, you know, our audience is waiting for something. And I, I guess, you know, 
I, I think a strong partnership is what we need and maybe that's what I'm gonna go look for after this call. Um, I think I have one in, in the pipeline uh, where we can partner with someone else and help them amplify their message and their mission. Um, I don't know your model, but what about like other artists um, yeah. that maybe that maybe you've got maybe do a collab maybe get them together maybe think about how you could um, you know you know create some sort of events and stuff whereby maybe they share stuff insights information I don't know something like that I definitely think um, having something like that and offering that to your tribe right now is 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 maybe of, of value but check with the tribe check with the tribe first yeah I think some partnerships could be really uh, beneficial at this point in time uh, specifically for especially if they're strategic partnerships where you know maybe it's not so much about selling at this point as much mm. as it is about as ashley was saying education partnerships where can you navigate the brand uh where can you navigate the audience because they're going to remember the moves that you make right now right and they're going to pay attention to that and whether or not you capitalized on it and came off as slightly skeezy or you 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 really were giving you know, that's what I'm seeing really good brands do, like that are not tone deaf. You had, I think you had asked what brands are doing it well. I'm seeing some amazing brands out there right now that I think are uh, definitely not tone deaf. They're, they're spending their time giving. Uh, they're cutting where they can to not have it keep it all for, you know, because that's our natural instinct, right, is to kind of like protect ourselves in those types of scenarios. And especially at the leadership level, leaders like often are like, uh oh, you know, like we're going to cast the rest of the employees aside and we're going to, you know, try to go into self preservation mode. When in fact, I think it's actually the right move and the more ethical move is to actually say, where can I cut back? Where can I pull back, scale back? And where can my brand at this point or my company give instead of try to take? Uh, and I think those are the kind of moves that, that will be remembered. Uh, in the long run of, of, of brands that are doing it well. Um, Annie, and I have one more thing that I just, just popped into my mind. So my apartment building in, in New York um, is doing this stuff where they're kind of helping people figure out what to do with all their time while they're at home. And so like they, what I um, have seen a lot, and I haven't looked into this at all, but it might be a good interesting content play for you guys but they're sending people to do virtual museum tours at like mm -hmm. MoMA or the Whitney stuff like that like is there stuff like that that you could share with your audience about what they could be spending their time doing as it relates to art so something like that might be interesting as well just to mm -hmm. kind of continue to share here's how you can experience art not physically but still keep it in your lives like by going on these interesting museum tours from a digital standpoint so that, that might so, be something to think that about is as so well cool. what, what if you could set up your own virtual uh, exhibition with your with your artists i don't know there, there, there must be ways of doing that um so how cool would that be like that would that would totally get some traction um and so yeah you can't come in and view the art but like we've set up something really spectacular for you you know and and even um even <laughs> You know, and allow people to walk around a space and design that space and, and make that make that digital space amazing. And then maybe someone could buy the product and it could be then shipped to their house or something. Who knows? That sounds yeah, amazing. Maybe, maybe I'm not giving us enough credit, Ashley. You know, I think we are doing all the things that, that you've hit on, including the virtual tours. Um, okay. It feels like what it is, is a lot of small things instead of mm -hmm. one really big cohesive thing. You know, when I think about yeah. a brand that's doing it really well, I think about Sweetgreen. Right. Um, their business is obviously really hurting, but they have made um, an, an, an effort and, and a big deal about donating meals to hospitals. And I think that they've run that whole campaign really, really well and right. in a heartfelt way. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I guess like that is the thing that we, we are missing um, mm -hmm. at this stage, but maybe it's not the thing we need. Maybe it's you know, something we partner on and help amplify somebody else's message. So I, I really appreciate your response and, and all of your good thoughts. Cool. Let us know how it goes. I will. <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay, Nikki. Nikki, I'm going to, all right, uh, Annie, I'm going to put you on mute. I'm going to switch over to Nikki. Hello, Nikki. All right, so Nikki asks, not necessarily COVID relevant, but with the pandemic, I've had all projects put on hold. I want to use the time for creation and really dig deeper on how to be a pioneer in the industry, change management, but I'm struggling with the disruption factor. Any ideas on this or any tips on this? So actually, uh, I want to um, 
I want have to have you, yeah, Nikki, yeah. can you expand on that a little bit? I want to make sure I understand the question fully. For sure. Uh, so I'm similar to Matt and I'm a solopreneur mm -hmm. and uh, it's been this way for uh, just under two years now um, where I've just been working with primarily two clients full time in the change management space. And now those clients have put projects on hold and I've really been feeling this need of, of I haven't been a fully authentic to to what I really want to be doing in the change management space. And so I've been trying to use this time now to um, kind of dig deeper in in what I think change management is and what I want to do with it and, and what can be done with it. Um, but I'm struggling a little bit with how to push harder or like how to really disrupt the space of change management, the industry. And I just wanted to know if you all had any ideas on how to just keep pushing outside of that box that we've drawn, right, around the change management industry or any industry, right, or how to like, redefine the, an industry. Do you want to take that, Ash? Uh, Matt, you That's know. a big one. That's yeah, a that massive is a big one. I know. <laughs> I mean, but I feel like how should we define an industry? Love it, love it. Okay, I've got a few thoughts. I've got a few thoughts. Um, so, I think what you're saying is is that you do, is it that you need something to, that you can sort of use as a rallying cry, something to sort of make you stand out? Is that the idea? Yeah, but I feel like the industry is a little old fashioned. Like it's it's been this this model for a couple decades and you've got a couple big leaders of a, a corporate corporations who are kind of the token change management learn this do this model and it's successful and i feel like there's a place for change um, especially now with part of it is with covid is we don't want things to go back to normal necessarily right we can help change management could be helpful to drive companies to help that new change or that new normal become become an actual reality and and help support that transition um so yeah i i, th I think my question is it's I, i'm struggling with how to present disruption all right all right here's some thoughts here's some thoughts we started the um this uh, this sort of Q and A, and both myself and Ashley and Sunny have written books, right? Have you ever thought about? You don't have to write a full on book, but what about um, a small, e you know, sort of PDF that kind of sets out your your position, draws your stake, is your um, is your is your mantra, is your kind of uh, manifesto for what you want to change, right? That's that's maybe one one thing, and what the opportunity of COVID brings to your industry. The next thing I would suggest in doing is um, getting a deck together, get a presentation together and video yourself giving that presentation, right? And, uh, and make it emotional, tell a story, you know, so, sort of really kind of push for that. I don't know if that redefines the industry, but it definitely carves out an opinion and, uh, and a position. And particularly if you have some sort of tactical plan, some sort of way that you think this could change things for the for the better for the good and you know sell in that vision draw that story paint that picture um and uh, and basically you know get yourself out there use use social media i don't know what setup you've got but um but basically you have to show a little bit of yourself if that makes sense as as a solo practitioner um which we don't it's uncomfortable to do but the the more you do it um the more that your personal brand and your personal opinion will get will get out there that's that's sort of what comes to mind, but I don't know. I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, I definitely encourage you to 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 sort of formalize that thought and push it out there in some sort of way that people can start dealing with and and understanding. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that, that was uh, great. I think that in order to become a thought leader, you have to consistently be consistent with framing out the world that you hope to create or to build. And so I think if you can start to think about all the questions that you've ever been asked. So this is something that Ashley and I are doing right now, actually, with Motto. And 
I, it's interesting because when we're talking to our clients, prospects, et cetera, we get a lot of the same questions again and again and again and again. And I said, why, you know, we're, we're answering the same questions like over and over and over again, because people have these kinds of gaps in what they understand or, or, or need uh, from that partnership. And so what we've been doing in sort of the downtime that we have, which has been considerable, <laughs> I mean, we're, it's strangely enough, like some of our clients are like really busy and like can't stop working. And then we have like other uh, companies that we're working with who literally dried up overnight. So what we're trying to do is uh, actually answer a lot of those questions in documentation, content, uh, video, uh, just Q and A's, like literally just like answering so much of that content. And so I think what to kind of uh, build on what Matt was saying, uh, you know, create a manifesto, create the vision of the world that you want to create, put that into some type of war cry or an articulation statement, and then actually create content. You can take one piece of content and cut that piece of content up into like 30 different slices of content. So what I see that some of our clients kind of struggle with the most is they don't actually know how to take what they know and disperse it out in such a way that they're hitting all types of platforms several times a day because you never know where that sort of momentum is gonna catch on. You don't know what that one piece of content is that's going to strike a chord, and all of a sudden now you have tons of people who are like broadcasting it and sharing it, and the thing is, is you've got to do volume. You've got to do tons of volume in order to really grasp that net, because it's so noisy. So one thing is to like get really clear about what it is that you wanna create, build a bunch of content around it, disperse it out as far and wide as you possibly can, as quickly as you can, as many times as you can, and then you start to make a name for yourself. And start to think back about all the questions that people have right now, like scour boards, like look on social media, do some social listening, where you're actually like hearing what people are saying as it relates to change management and answer every single one of those questions in a piece of content or a video. Uh, that that's how I would do it. I think it's all about taking these ideas and actually making them super tactile because I think it's nothing without execution. The problem is, and make, well, actually what the advantage is that you have is that you can just work harder than everyone else because a lot of people know how to do these things, but they actually don't do them. So you have an advantage if you actually take those strategies and then now you go and implement them in this time period while you have a little bit of time where you're in between, like just hit it so hard that like, you won't help but get noticed. You might not get noticed like today or tomorrow, but those slight chips away, you're going to start to, people are going to start paying attention to you as an authority. And that's, that's exactly what I would do. For sure. Is that helpful, Nikki? Oh yes, extremely helpful. Thank you everyone. I really yeah, appreciate thanks. it. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. Um, yeah, I wondered so if we could move over to, um, I think it's, uh, I think it was Amanda. Yeah. Amanda, are you there? Can we, uh, Amanda Howard, can we get Amanda on? I'll, uh, I'd like you to sort of explain your question. It seems a very relevant and interesting question. Um, so, so I'm based in Nottingham as well. Oh, hello. Um, <laughs> um, sorry. I just hey. realized there's the sun behind me. I'm just going to go and close the blind. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> it's very sunny in Nottingham today, everybody. Um, yeah, she looked like she was glowing there for a minute. I was like, watch out. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Wow. Levitating. Um, so I work... <clears throat> oh, oh, Amanda, your, your sound's gone. Your sound's gone. Have you knocked a microphone? That better? That's better. Oh, you're back. You Go for yeah. it. Sorry about that. So I work for a company called Medichex.com. We do online blood tests yeah. and we do them remotely. So you get a kit to your home, you can do the test and send it away and then you get the results online. So we've been kind of working in the telemedicine digital space for 17 years. Um, and um, we've done over 5 million blood tests. So we kind of know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is obviously at the moment we're offering a service for people who perhaps have never understood it before. Um, so we're talking to lots of new audiences um, and also we are developing a COVID-19 test, immunity test, which we are working with various partners in the NHS to get validated um, and we will want to give it to core workers, but also we will probably want to work with corporates to, um, and potentially individuals to, to offer it to them. Amazing. So obviously this, this is the space in which we've been for a long while and we've got a certain amount of credibility. We have not chosen to go out there with the first product we could have. We want to go out with a product that's validated and works. And as I say, we've been talking, I've never spoken, I've managed to get an NHS contract this week, which we've never, ever done. Um, Congratulations. But for me, how do we position ourselves that 
we're not jumping on the bandwagon. This is what we do. This is our skill. We, you know, we have a software and a platform that enables us to do this at scale. Um, and we think it's a service that's really useful. But I see so many people being seen as jumping on the bandwagon. Mm. And I'm, I kind of want to, I want to stay true to our brand and who we are, but I'm conscious we're a new brand to most people we'll be talking to. It's a glorious question, that one. <laughs> I think, yeah, I, well, again, like, what an amazing story. Um, and, uh, you know, we, I know, you know, I, for those around the world, like, in the UK, we're, our testing is, is, is not great here, and uh, it can make a huge impact. So fantastic that you've got something, you know, an offer, because that's going to definitely be needed. Um, in terms of in terms of how you position, you know, really what you're saying is you're not repositioning. You're just opening up another another offer, um, which actually still fits within the the brand proposition and the space yeah. that you've been operating yeah. in. So I, yeah. I would actually say to you, um, don't worry, you know, don't worry about that. Um, obviously, um, you know, you, you just want to go out there and say, look, we this is what we do. Um, obviously, we're we're working on on something for COVID nineteen. Um, here it is. Um, and this is and and this is part of our overall story, our last seventeen year story, and uh, we're just doing what we always do. So, I would kind of hammer that like this is this is what we are about, and this is and this is another way that we're helping to serve the public in in this way. Um, so that would be my message to you. Um, don't worry, don't don't be shy about it. Don't be British about it. Be more American. Maybe Sunny and Ashley can uh, can say a few things about being American. Oh, <laughs> yeah, okay. uh, yeah, Amanda, Thanks. you gotta. Yeah, I know who you are, Amanda. It's, I think uh, I have something to say about that too. Go ahead. Do it, do it. I, I think what the, the advice that Matt gave you is really smart and I totally agree. You don't have anything to be opportunistic about. No. Um, that's where a lot of brands that are having that, um, that sense of kind of jumping on the bandwagon, it's because it's kind of, it's so far of a leap that it is being perceived as being opportunistic. I think you guys are in a completely different category, right? Where you're already in the health and wellness space. Um, you're already, you already have a purpose and a reason for being that transcends just the products that you mm -hmm. sell and what you make. And I would lean into that and re bring that back into the front of your brand communication. So when, we're, when you're talking about the kind of work that you do, the 5 million people that have already used this product and have already used your test kits to, um, to, to take their blood and to test their blood in some way, I think that that is, that is a pretty significant scale. So I would just go back to the idea of, of why you guys are really doing this to begin with. There's such a human element to your brand um, and a health, such a health and wellness element to your brand that I think is a very relevant conversation, obviously, right now. Um, to me, it doesn't sound opportunistic at all. It just sounds like we're just continuing on the path that we have been on for all these years. And this is just bringing this almost to realize our, our, our fullest potential. Yeah. Um, and I think it just so happens that in this moment, you guys are the right people to be doing this because you have the experience, you have the know-how, the talent, the skill um, to be able to distribute something like this at a mass scale. So I would just make sure that the, the, the communication is coming from a very uh, central, purposeful point of view for the brand. And I don't think it would be perceived as uh, jumping on a bandwagon at all. Yeah, I think uh, I actually have some real tactile things that you could start doing immediately. So what I would do, I don't know if you've, you're familiar with, but have you ever watched uh, Dr. Berg? Yeah. Okay. So do you know how he sort of films like the whiteboard behind him? And he's been doing yeah. some really interesting recent uh, mm -hmm. breakdowns of like COVID and, and sort of, you know, does zinc play a role? And so I think what a lot of your audience right now is concerned about is perhaps not that testing is not important, but I actually think that there's a lack of uh, of true knowledge, right? There's a lot of uh, information out there that is conflicting. And so what I think you guys should be doing is like communicating very quickly, very often. So yes. not so much as like this test is coming, but rather let us explain to you, like we are working on this thing, but we want to explain to you and clear up some confusion, you know, some uh, confusion. 
around what's been said, what's going on. Let us kind of break down like what happens when COVID is in the air or on a piece of cardboard or like start coming at it very quickly about dispersing anything that you know is not true. Because there are research papers. There's a lot of documentation out there right now um, about COVID that was done. Even the, 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 um, the coronavirus in, in general, like those novel viruses have been around forever and there's a lot of research and, and, and uh, documentation on it. So what you guys could do is communicate early and often, uh, maybe get, get one of some of your teammates like on a whiteboard, start breaking stuff down, video record it. And what you do in those um, sort of instructionals is you drop hints about your credibility. So you can say like, you know, we've been doing these things for the last, you know, X amount of years, we've tested over 5 million people, we're currently working on something, and then you go right back into education mode, but you're just dropping the seed, you're just sort of letting the seed kind of hit the air. And what that's going to do is it's going to start build credibility and trust, so that when that test comes out, that everybody's going to look to you because they would have been like, man, I've been watching all of their videos, like, I feel like they're such a source of knowledge, because I've been watching a lot of different videos on this. And I actually think that very few are actually doing a good job. I think it's super hyped up. It's very confusing. You don't, you're hearing, you know, wear a mask, go to the store, you know, when you get in, like wipe everything down. It can live on cardboard. It can't live on cardboard. You should be six feet away. Or if you're spending 30 minutes with somebody and you're side by side, you know, that can be like, there's just a lot of different types of information out there. So if you guys can actually come at it with what Dr. Berg is doing, which I think is extremely helpful because he's breaking down something very complex into sort of bite-sized bits and he's educating you and you all of a sudden you're just like trusting this guy and you're just believing every word that comes out of his mouth because he's so clear about something that is so unclear. So if you guys can take that stance, you know, communicate early, often, quickly, be an education source and then start to slowly like, you know, ramp up that you guys are sort of releasing this and then you've already established your credibility. That way you don't have to sort of appear out of nowhere that now all of a sudden you're jumping on the bandwagon. I actually think that's um, to, to Ashley and, and Matt's point, you don't even need to worry about that. It's just the tact in which you use yeah. to go from where you are now to releasing the test. Those are the micro steps that matter. If that yeah, I think Sonny is absolutely spot on with that. You've got to own that um, that knowledge space, if that yeah. makes sense, for, yeah. your, for your tribe. I go back to that idea, right? Yeah. So, is that helpful, so, Amanda? I mean, do you think is that something that you guys could do or pull off as mm. part of Yeah, we've got, I've got a great medical director who's also a GP. Um, in one of the most impacted areas in the UK at the moment as well. So um, he's great. So I can just do some um, kind of video conversations with him. And I think that they'd be good. And we've got lots of data around, actually, there's other things you can be doing to help fight it around underlying conditions. And there's health care, there's health changes you can make to help support your immunity as well. So, I th- and so there's a whole range of content. And then I think um, we've got an interesting story around testing. So we, went, we reached out to our, our tribe. Um, to get samples to test and it's great because um, I wrote one email and it, it's amazing how far it's gone it's gone to like national blood transfusion and sky and um, and we've got a um, hundred samples now from you know ITU consultants and nurses and lots of things so I think it's a nice story and I just need to start telling it yeah yeah it's, I guess it's having that confidence as well and I think just one thing on that although um you know, being sort of in the brand and marketing space, it's lovely to, to, to get everything polished and perfect. I think one of the things that I'm noticing, and I, and I, and I don't know if you are, Sonny and Ashley, is that authenticity is like yeah. a huge thing right now. So don't, don't worry about spending hours and hours crafting something. You know, just do a quick video, split it yeah. up and share it. And you'll see how quick that you'll probably get more traction from that than you would some sort of really highly polished, you know, voiceover based kind of sort of well, uh, stylization. Moment, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I think too many brands right now are actually trying to like craft uh, all of these perfect messages. And I yeah. think we're in such an unperfect time and you're getting emails and communication. I mean, I'm hearing from brands that I think I bought like a coffee from one time and I've never received any communication from them. And now all of a sudden they're, you're telling me all of their practices and everything that they're doing and how careful they are. And, you know, and I'm sort of like, gosh, this is so tone deaf. Like what, what why are you telling me this? Like it, we're already bombarded. We're already overwhelmed. You have to know what the mental space is. And I think you just have to cut the bullshit and like go right to like what you know best and just do you like, 
We're yeah. so afraid to own who we are. And when, especially we're in a situation like this, where now we start to rethink everything we're doing because now we're in a, a place of uncertainty. So that's what I think really poor leadership and poor brands do is that they actually get paralyzed. Like we talked about this on the last call, but this idea of going thorn where brands and organizations uh, literally become paralyzed like a rabbit and they rethink every single thing that they're doing and, and, and they try to craft a new mission and a new purpose and a new values and all these things. When we have to realize that, that, that this pandemic, yes, it's changing the landscape, but it's not completely gonna last forever. Like business will go back and brands will continue and business will, will, will be back on track uh, may, maybe not in the next 30 to 90 days, but eventually uh, we will return to some type of business climate where we're all back in the game again. And I think that what we have to just do right now is to, you know, not completely like throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, I think fear and paralyzation is actually, it's worse to try to do a bunch of crazy things versus just doing a couple of things really, really well and sticking to what you know and then pivoting those things to adapt to this kind of crazy peak, but realize that the mission and the values and the things that you guys really hold dear and who you are at your core, I don't think actually has to change. I think you just have to sort of repivot it for what you know is gonna work right now in the moment and then go back to some of the tactics that have always worked. So that's my advice anyway. Brilliant, thank you, that's been really helpful. Yeah, and reach out to us by the way. Any Anyone on this call can reach out to you. Yeah, out to everybody and um, you know, make sure that you guys uh, can can touch base with us and let us know how things are going. Um, let's, if there's anyone else that has one final question, we're almost at the end of their, um, let's see, I guess we do have one. We've got question. one more, yeah. All so, right, so Nadia, if that's the way, the correct, correct pronunciation of your name, we'll take your question and then um, that might be it. Yeah, and fire, fire off any more if you guys can while we have a few minutes here left. So I'm gonna unmute you. Nadia. Hey, Nadia. Maybe she, oh, there she is. Hello. We can't hear you if you're chatting. <laughs> um, let's see, we can just maybe just go directly to. Let's just ask the, the question. question. Okay, so. Matt, are you able to see that question? I can't see. I've just been trying to find it. Are you there, Nadia? I have unmuted. Why can't we hear you? Um, we can't hear you if you're talking. What? What's? What, can you guys see the question? Yeah, I think it looks like she might have just put it in a private chat. Um, ah, well, that's why I can't see it. I'll just read it because Nadia, we we can't hear you for some reason. I don't know if you want to check your um, your audio. Yeah, if you're on headphones or something. Go. Sunny, go ahead and read. Okay. That. So Nadia says, these days we are mostly talking about how to get our clients to connect with customers and continue selling. Do you think we as brand strategists in a way should be thinking of introducing new online tools so that clients can bring their businesses online in new ways like apps, portals, et cetera, because it was in a way inevitable that businesses would move online future. It's just, we have been thrown into this situation all of a sudden, yes. Okay, got it. Uh, Ashley, do you have some thoughts on that or who wants to take it? Do you think we, I'm going to repeat the question, Matt, so you can get that too. Thank I you. Thank you very much. Question. Do you think we as brand strategists in a way should be thinking of introducing new online tools so that clients can bring their business online in new ways? Uh, that is a very universal question. I would go back to principles of branding, right? Of brand strategy. So who are we here to serve? Um, and I would say that even without this sort of um, problem that we're all facing with the virus, um, I would say having um, a way of, of helping people and bringing them into a platform and bringing them together and allowing them to support each other and listening and connecting and adding value to them is, uh, is, is something you'd want to do anyway. But now that we are facing um, you know, lockdown and, and all of the challenges that we are, I would say now more than ever is a great time to, to, to try and support your tribe by getting them um, to connect online. So I think uh, to our reply to your sort of question in quite a general way, I think, yes, anything that connects your brand and adds value is, is going to be good. Um, I'd sort of challenge one thing, which is, um, of course, 
like having a mindset that we are here to just sell, I think is, is, is something that I would, I would push back upon. I think we need to, obviously we need to sell, right. To, to be alive and as a business and to kind of sustain ourselves. But if that's our focus, then we're going to miss out because our, our, our audience, our customers, they don't really care how much money we want to make. What they care about is the change that we're going to bring to them in their lives. And so, you know, the brand isn't what we say it is, it's what the customer says it is. So we've got to go back to that sort of principle of brand empathy. Like what, what value would it be to somebody if you've created this platform um, where they can all talk together? Um, that would be my sort of, my sort of point. Is it, if, it, if it's there so that you can just push out and sell to them, then obviously we've got, we've got a, I don't think anyone would join it. But if it's there to add value, so that they love getting involved in it, they love connecting on it, they love sharing information on it, they, they, they're really getting value, they're getting their questions answered or whatever it might be, then is, it kind of naturally will go on to the fact that hopefully they'll buy from you um, and become champions of, of the brand. So I guess it was just a couple of things, maybe it's just the way you worded the question, but um, I hope you don't mind me sort of pushing back against that a little bit. But I would say, yeah, we've got to connect people. I would say the, the, the final sort of thing I would mention is, um, really the the thing that's creating huge value is experiences that's what people crave and want and um the the challenge i think brands have got is to move from being commodities to move up you know a lot of brands create services around their product offering but really the the, the sort of the gold standard is to move into the experience economy the how can we put our services and products together and package them and offer them out to our to our tribe so they have an amazing experience that is the key and i think just on that from um you know I, I was working funny enough um, just uh, just this week with an events company and you can imagine they're absolutely stung, absolutely huge. They can't put their, their this particular company was a, a, a gin festival, right? That's one of the, one of the things that they're the sort of offerings that they ran. So we were working on ideas whereby, well, um, obviously we could do it online as a zoom call, but that's just dull, isn't it? Everybody's doing stuff online. That's not the same experience. So we dug back deep into why do people go to this gin festival in the first place, right? What are our assumptions around that? Um, they go to explore new gins and they go to meet new people, right? So if we can take those two ideas and put them online, how would, what would that look like? Uh, what, how could we meet that need? Um, and so we've come up with all sorts of insane ideas um, whereby we're trying to create an experience um, that is basically the offline experience and the, and the core drivers of that online. And just to sort of give a couple of ideas away, um, if, you, if, you start, if you start thinking about, for example, sending a lot of, in the UK, the postal service is still kind of operating. So we can still send stuff out. So if you sent, for example, all the delegates, um, uh, we were working on, say, a little pack with some nice new gins on it, with some interesting things that don't make much sense unless you actually attend the online, um, the online experience, then, um, then what you will do is you'll get higher engagement and you'll add that value to, to the tribe. So we've got loads of ideas around that, which I can't probably share for confidentiality issues. But the, 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 the thing is, is that you can be innovative in the digital space and create those digital experiences with people live in the moment and make it really interesting for them. So I hope that was hope that was helpful. I don't know if you guys, Sonny and Ashley, have anything to say about that. No, I mean, I, I, you covered it really well, Matt. I think a lot of businesses who are not used to having um, their business online are really struggling mm. to figure out how they can bring that because I do think that um, brick and mortar is not going to go away by any means, but there are going to be a lot of companies that don't survive this. And I think the ones that will are the ones that are going to be able to bring more of their business online and create more community around their brand online. So I do think it is the responsibility of a brand strategist. And it maybe sounds like Nadia, you are a brand strategist. So you're maybe struggling with this question. Um, I do think it is the responsibility of a brand strategist or of a branding person. If you're working with a company or a client that is really struggling in this realm to figure out how they bring more of their business online, how they create more awareness for their brand online and how they build a community and a tribe 
around their brand online and in online um, atmospheres. And so I think it is our job to help usher that transition in um, with new ideas and ways of thinking and help a um, more traditional business become more of a digital business in the future. Um, and that doesn't happen overnight. And it's certainly not going <laughs> to, um, you know, a lot of businesses are being forced into this and totally outside of their comfort zones. But I think that's where a lot of the growth is going to happen. Um, and so I'm really excited to be able to work with clients that who, who have not really had this problem in the past, but have, who have probably recognized it even before this thing hit. You know what? We need to really do better when it comes to digital. We need to do better when it comes to online. Um, this, this was looming in a lot of business leaders' minds before this ever happened. So this was just the thing that forced them into this kind of more online world. Um, and I do think that we should continue to try to, to, try to help them in, in the best way that we can. So yeah, hopefully I, that was helpful. But I wouldn't do, I wouldn't build apps or portals uh, for the sake of doing it. I, I think there has to be a really good reason. And yeah. you want to make sure that you're investing your resources wisely and to not put yourself in a situation where you are uh, building something for a temporary problem. So if you were to think about, you know, how long it might take to do something like that, it might not, the, the benefit just might not be there. So customer portals, things like that, apps, you know, I'd, I'd need to know a little bit more about that to sort of weigh in on whether I think that's a strategic decision. I mean, I could be swayed, but I don't, I don't think my gut tells me that's not the right place to put your energy. Uh, but perhaps there are things uh, as Ashley and Matt were saying, that you could do from an education standpoint, from a content standpoint. Also, you know, we're doing a tremendous amount of virtual workshops. I mean, we've got teams that are in like eight different countries right now that we're navigating through uh, brand and leadership workshops because not necessarily to not only help them think about where their brands are at and how to pivot, but also to also see things as opportunities. Because a lot of times what I'm seeing is the sentiment is that uh, everything is shuttering Whereas like I see these things as actual opportunity to gain a new audience, to build a new audience, to communicate with a new audience, because you now have the opportunity to reach customers that you were never able to get before. And not only are these people that are moving digitally will perhaps remain your customer who were used to shopping on, you know, direct in a environment or in retail now shifting to buying things online because they have to, They've been forced into buying things online. So now they're becoming more savvy. They're becoming more knowledgeable. And now you can quickly elevate your brand or your position or whatever you're doing to meet that need. Or even things like where companies who have never been in a, in a digital environment, you have the opportunity to navigate them through how to work in a digital environment. So there's just, in my mind, more opportunity than I think a lot of companies actually realize there is and how to double down on the things that uh, you, you, you can do to, to grow and expand your business in a very difficult time. Love that, Sonny. All right. We have one more worst. We'll stay on to answer this one more, Matt, and maybe you will too. Um, and th this is a good ending question. Um, well, Tonio, okay. One, two. Yeah. Keep, keep coming. If, if you got a couple, we can stay a little bit longer. So, um, Hamza, I think I pronounced it correctly. Uh, you said how, um, can you tell us how you envision the world after this pandemic? I don't believe it'll go back as it was before. So that's a very broad question. Um, no, I don't think it's going to go back the way that it was before. I think some inevitable shifts are going to happen more towards digital, obviously. Um, I think a lot of businesses won't survive this and they'll have to think about, um, you know, their people have to think about how you know what what to do with their skills and their talents i think a tremendous amount of new innovation is going to occur mm -hmm. because we're of already this. seeing it we're, we're seeing already it right seeing now. it mm -hmm. um so i think that is that it's going to be something that is going to be a beautiful thing um i think social distancing once we all get over the fear of where we're at right now and like being scared to be next to somebody socially or hug them or shake their hand um, there's a lot of fear around that. And so I don't know how long it's going to take us to get over that fear that we we're, we're learning now um, with this new behavior, or if we ever will, or if we're going to 
continue to keep our distance from people for a long time to come. I, I don't, I can't speak on that, but I do think lots of new innovation is going to occur. We're going to see um, lots of breakdown of old ways of doing things, a lot of rising of new ways of doing things across all industries and sectors. And I think it's going to be pretty magnificent um, mm -hmm. to, to watch. I think a lot of companies are going to realize that they don't need their big overheady offices. Yeah. I think that's going to be a huge thing for a lot of companies because they're going to get used to working from home and having remote teams and be like, wow, I can build a culture. I can maintain a company. I can be a leader. I can have leaders within my company who are not sitting in the same room together. I think that's going to be a big aha moment and it is a, a big aha moment for many companies right now. I also think that there's going to be a lot of companies who are going to realize that they took for granted the retail experience when they could have been digital all along and where those direct to consumer brands were really like, front and center and have kind of got the, the keys to the kingdom, so to speak, have been more smart about navigating um, that consumer. I think you're going to see a lot of uh, brands that rested on their laurels, like quickly trying to pivot and catch up and, and becoming more accustomed to how important it is to be digital first in this type of uh, landscape. And then I also think you're going to see a lot of direct to consumer brands that I think we're already seeing the chips in the armor on some of these brands anyway. A lot of these brands at random market and have really inflated numbers and you know sort of look like they're the the new uh, they're the new David in a world of Goliaths. And I actually think that you're going to see a lot of those companies exposed. I mean, Brandless was a great example of that. I think a lot of brands like even Warby Parker, Casper. Uh, all of these direct-to-consumer brands that sort of everyone is looked to. I mean, at least every other call we get is uh, a, a brand that wants to be a look-alike to another brand, but actually they don't actually understand that that success is not actually a true accurate picture of that success. Uh, so I think we're going to see a lot of direct-to-consumer brands flounder because they all, in my opinion, are starting to look the same from a brand standpoint. So I think it's going to become even more competitive to build a brand, an ownable brand in this space where everybody is now going to be, it's like a congestion on a highway where so many brands are trying to like be first and raise their hand a little bit higher and rise above the noise. So I think you're going to see brand play a more pivotal role uh, in, in even more so than it has before. You're going to start to see your online experiences uh, need to be shaped and curated and really to ex sort of, um, make that brand stand out in such a way that people really understand who you are and without ever maybe physically touching your product. So that's a new challenge, I think, for, for, some, for some companies and organizations as well. Anything else? I'm trying to get anything else that comes Matt, to Matt, you mind. got anything? Um, well, I think, I think it's, um, you know, two things come to mind. Um, I'm in two, two modes of thought on this. Um, kind of, we like to think that there'll be huge shifts, like complete changes and of course there will be in some places but ultimately human nature does not change right um the way that we consumers uh, behave um i definitely see some changes for example we're going to be much more conscious around you know what we touch who we're around how close we are to them at least for a little bit as as ashley says until the fear dies down we're going to be looking for products that you know help us you know hand gels things like that things that we've never Probably, well, we may not have, have been too fussed about before. And I think brands are definitely like supermarkets and, um, and airlines and, and sort of public service um, offerings are going to have to take that very, very seriously in terms of providing safety for their customers. Um, but, but, but really, my kind of, my other thought is, it's kind of, kind of probably, is it going to snap back to you know, just with minor adjustments, like longer term, if we're in 10 years time, when we look back, yeah, there'll be some businesses gone, but consumer behavior, how is that going to change massively? So my kind of take on it is that, that, that maybe it won't change as massively as we, as we initially think, you know, we're sat here now, the chaos is going on, but in 10 years time, when we look back at this moment, we'll say, well, was life massively different? I don't think it will be massively different. I think things will um, get back to some form of normality, but uh, that's just my gut. That's just my gut from kind of knowing human nature and knowing that you know people are going to love to go to pubs and clubs and restaurants and bars and that that you know it will and travel. That's going to come back. It's just that there'll be these little frills around the edge to help keep us safer and to and brands will will want to make sure that 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 happens in those industries. But I definitely also would sort of say what Sonny said about innovation. 
coming up with new ideas. Businesses and brands are going to find um, that the pivots that they're making now actually are kind of working. And so the customers that they, they gain in these innovative moments, you know, they're not going to suddenly switch them off. They're going to keep that service, that offering going. And so I definitely think we do, we will see some, some new and innovative ways of, of doing business in the digital space, like, like, like has already been said. So I kind of have like this really weird, I don't even know if that answers the question, but I have this kind of weird thing. It depends on your industry. It depends on your consumer behavior within that industry as to how big the change will be. My gut says that in, in 10 years time, it, it, it won't look massively different. To, to how it looked 15 years ago, apart from some of these innovations. But that's just my, my gut. We'll see if I'm right or not. I hope that's yeah. the case anyway. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, okay, I think we've got one last question from Tonio. I'm gonna unmute you, Tonio, so that you can ask your question, okay? Uh, how do I unmute? Okay, okay. I'm, I'm here. Hey. Hi, thanks so much. Um, Forgive me if this is a bit of a tangent, but um, it's a question kind of on personal brand. I, I run a very humble, small network of creatives, designers, mm -hmm. and you know our entire client base kind of dried up overnight, small businesses to you know, mid-range. And what I want to do is, my question is, you know, how can I better be of service to my clients after this period, right? So I want to really make this time um, take this time to like let them do what they need to keep their business alive or die and you know how can I stay in this learning mode what what kind of things can I do to develop and it, I really appreciate the example of like thinking about the questions that I'm always answering but like maybe what grad school programs can help me or what what tools can I just make myself and my my clients better you know um, and uh, maybe even break into an agency setting what you know what how you know maybe thinking about your careers backwards um, mm. that's a fantastic question you know what was a really good question well, I, I think what was really interesting about like some of our uh questions is that over like the 15 years that we've been doing this like they were all the same the questions are fundamentally like eternally the same and i thought that they would change over time as more and more people became more educated but actually the fundamental questions remain the same so if you can actually answer those questions, I think that uh, you are in a better position to arm yourself and your uh, team and your own work with the knowledge that you need to answer the, the appropriate questions that I think are universal, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then I think you had mentioned something about learning and, and immersing yourselves. I think great leaders like are, are curious by nature and learn consistently. They, they are hungry for every ounce of information that seems relevant or unrelevant at the time. I know that I look to, uh, even when we're evaluating clients, like I look outside of their industry all the time for ideas because they're so, uh, they're so uh, sort of um, possessed with this idea of like looking over their shoulder and mm -hmm. looking to the right and to the left because they want to see uh, what they're, who, who's doing what. Yeah. And I actually think that great leaders and great innovators don't really do that. They don't spend the time. You heard, you, you, I don't know if you guys ever remember that. I think it was in the U.S. Olympics where Michael Phelps uh, was, um, what was that guy's name that he was, uh, you guys might know here, he put it in the chat, but he was racing beside uh, his kind of nemesis and the guy in the lane next to him right before they hit the end of the finish line came up for a breath and looked over and they caught the shot of him looking at Michael Phelps and he lost the race. Yeah. So I think that really brands, uh, and, and even if you're a, a sole proprietor, you have to sort of go with your gut, go with your instinct, learn as much as you can, um, deep dive into a lot of different industries and arm yourself as a secret weapon mm -hmm. so that you can apply yourself no matter what you're doing, uh, yeah. and navigate this landscape, with the tools and, and, and talent that you already have. You don't necessarily need to go get more talent. You just need to know how to leverage that talent to navigate yourself through these challenging times. That's what we sort of all forget is that we have these gifts. That's what our book is about. It's about tapping into owning all of who we are, not just the pretty parts, really understanding that we all bring unique gifts and talents and traits to the table uh, mm -hmm. that are irreplaceable. And we can go in and try to find ways to not be replaceable so that 
wherever we're at, whatever table we're at, whatever challenge that we're met with, that we know how to navigate it because we can use the things that we know and who we are to actually rise to that occasion. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I, you probably already have within you some of the skill sets already that you need to kind of navigate this weird time we're all going through. Yeah, and I would add to that, and I, I know Matt, you've got a you've got a thing to say about this too. Um, you know, this is a very real question because we're in in similar boats, all of us, right? The Matt, us, and you, we all have a similar type of business in some ways. Um, and I think that the way you asked the question, how can I help my clients? And I think what's interesting about that question is that the way that you help your clients is by helping yourself in your own business. Mm -hmm. So work on your business right now. Not, you know what I mean? Like learn your finances, mm -hmm. learn your, better your contracts, get, work on your decks. You know what I mean? Like work on your internal stuff, your operations, your processes, your systems, learn as much as you can about your P and L, you know, like whatever weak spots you have yeah. as an owner in your business. I think now is the time that you can really like it's learn how to be a better owner. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because that's how you're going to ultimately end up helping your clients. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's even some great resources. I don't know if you guys know of David Baker, for example, is a guy who's been doing this for years. He works, he's an expert that works specifically with creative agencies on their positioning and stuff. He's got a ton of amazing content that helps people like us, like know what to do or how to do it. You know, you can take it with a grain of salt or you can really like dig in and, and learn from somebody like him. Or even like a Blair Ends, right? The win without pitching guy. I don't know if you know who that is, but you know, a lot of really valuable insight from experts who, who, who's, whose focus it is to help creative businesses run better businesses and help you be a better business owner. Because yeah. I think what, what happens in a lot of creative agencies is you love it for the passion and the design and the, the creativity of it, but you're not probably the best in business. So I think the, the mm -hmm. way that you can get yeah. better is to become a better business person. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would suggest taking the time to work on that. Yeah, I would also make one caveat. Is it your clients just so, so there are industries right now that are completely dried up. So a great example is one of our clients uh, was, is in the movie industry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Completely like they are in the business of making films, distributing films, getting their films in the uh, theaters and they are completely paralyzed right now. Then we have another client who does automated text voice and calling and they literally are like maxed to the point. So they, 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 they can't even like withstand how much business they have. Yeah. So what you also have to do is take kind of an audit of your existing client base and say, all right, what, what clients do I have right now that are actually struggling? Let me go and help them. Yeah. Then you look at the clients who are actually doing well, because I'm sure in somewhere in your lineup, you've got some clients that are doing well. Not all of our clients are in trouble. Uh, many of our clients are thriving right now, strangely. Uh, and they're coming to us to just like figure out how to navigate the overflow of, in, uh, of, of uh, business that they have. So it's an interesting dichotomy. You've got like people who are like literally have no business and then you have people who have like too much business. Yeah. Um, and we're dealing with both of those scenarios. So uh, you know, go to where the money's at, mm -hmm. go to where you're, go to where people can pay you, you know, mm -hmm. like you've got to keep the business running. So go to where people can pay you, but don't spend your time. Don't spend so much time in with people that just simply can't afford you right now. It doesn't mean that they don't have, they don't mean well, it's just, they don't have the money to give you. Yeah. So just try to give to them in a way that you can and, and, and try to work with people that can actually pay you. Cause we've got that situation going on right now where, you know, we've got, clients who are, we're working with and it's they're fine there's, there's no you would never know that there's a problem going on so that's my um, i've got a couple of thoughts if i may before we wrap yeah. up just for uh, tonio um so um your question really is like how do you, how can you better serve your clients uh, your customers in the future which i thought was quite interesting uh, because currently their work has dried up i would say um if all of that's happened across the board like hopefully not but as uh, um, as sunny has said but you know 
again, go and ask them, talk to them, open up dialogue with them. Like, how can I be of service? What can I do to help? Um, I would say a couple of things if, um, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if you're, are you, would you say you're quite early on in your career, Tonio? Or like, how would you sort of? Early on, yeah. Yeah? Um, yeah, I am. Okay, a couple of thoughts then. Um, one would be, um, get, try and find a mentor for yourself. Like, mm -hmm. that's always a good thing. It doesn't even have to be in this industry. Try and find a mentor and, uh, and, and see whether you can meet with them like on a monthly uh, basis. That might be an idea. Um, I would also like to throw in a couple of sort of online learning things. IBM are doing a design thinking courses. They're, they're currently offer, they're offering them for free, which I think is amazing. So shout out for IBM. Um, you've also got the kind of design thinking stuff with AJ and Smart. That's really cool. Um, read books. Um, you know, there's there's a few books we've already mentioned uh, already on the on the webinar. Uh, so Rare Breed, uh, there you go, as a shout out, ladies. Um, Story Atogy. But, you know, I find um, if you want to move it more into the strategic space, um, anything by Marty Neumeyer, who, who I've had the privilege of being mentored by, he he's fantastic. Um, Chris Doe in the future and what they're doing over on their YouTube channel is also fantastic from a creative perspective. So definitely check out the future without an E. Uh, on 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 um, on YouTube. So that's just named a few. There's just to name kind of a few um, a few things that might help. So hopefully that kind of that kind of makes sense. Um, I think we're probably going to wrap up now. Um, yeah. You know, oh, someone's just put Seth Godin. Absolutely, the old MBA courses that he runs. Anything that comes out of Seth Godin's mind is brilliant. Um, so definitely shout out to Seth um, for that. And we'll we'll send everybody a uh, an email when this is uh when we wrap with a link to this as well as uh links to some of the people that we had i think we all had mentioned on here so kind of giving everybody like a quick jump off point for some of the resources that we mentioned in here i've got a ton that i can put in and i, I bet ashley and matt do too let's so do that we'll, yeah we'll share as much as we know uh with you guys to to help you and you know, yeah, like Matt said, you need a mentor, like shoot Ashley and I a note, shoot Matt a note. We're happy to uh, help you in any way that we can because we've certainly learned a, a bit and we've taken a few black eyes in the process. And uh, so happy to, to share where to steer clear from and also what to, what to push forward on. So yes. hope you guys enjoyed it. We really had a blast. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, for, thanks for joining us, guys. And uh, right. stay safe and we'll, we'll, we'll catch up with you soon, I'm sure. Thank you. Sounds good. Adios, everybody.